Today's scripture is from the book of Job in the Old Testament. Job 38, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of this earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst from its womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Here ends the reading and may God bless these words to our understanding. Thank you, Priscilla. I got good news for those of you who are hot right now. I uh, wrote this sermon with uh, three baptisms and a heat wave in mind, so it's going to be a little shorter than my usual sermons. This is part four in an environmental Christianity sermon series that we've been doing since Easter, uh, an opportunity for us to reflect on the ways in which God teaches us through nature and the ways in which uh, we may be stewards of God's creation. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer for today's sermon? Gracious God, may the words of my lips, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. So this year I've gotten certified in scuba diving, and it has given me a whole new perspective on the oceans, both literally and spiritually. First, let me describe the literal perspective change. Just a few weeks ago, I went diving off the coast of Cozumel, Mexico. I was doing what they call a wall dive because at the dive site, the ocean floor is steep and there are layers of marine life based on the depth and the amount of light. You start these dives deep, about 80 feet down, and then you work your way up to the coral reef sweet spot, which is about 40 feet. The waters are crystal clear with visibility beyond 100 feet. And there is truly a stunning array of plants and corals and wildlife. It is an underwater Eden there. Now, I've seen this kind of stuff on nature shows before. And on uh, previous dives and snorkeling, I've had a chance to look down on these wonderful coral reefs. Uh, but here's, here's the real perspective change. This time, I got to look up at it. 80 feet deep and see all the fish and coral above my head. The sun shining past them and onto me. It was magical. Part of being a human is having a spiritual connection with the natural world. And I haven't felt it that powerfully in a long time. You know, growing up near the beach and surfing as a young adult, I, I've always cared about the oceans and their health and the, the ways in which humans depend on the oceans. But now I feel it in my bones on a whole new level. You know, Genesis tells us that before God created the world, there was chaos and darkness. And in that chaos and darkness, there was already water. Water was part of the clay of God's creation. And Genesis also says that God created a dome to separate the waters above from the waters below. You know, ancient Hebrews saw dry land as a sort of bubble in a cosmic ocean. The waters above brought rain, and the waters below brought wells and aquifers, springs and oceans. God set the boundaries of the sea and the land, and with that one notable exception, made sure that dry land never flooded the earth 
completely. Job puts it poetically in today's passage when God answers him out of the whirlwind and says about the oceans, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here your proud waves shall be stopped. Your bulletin cover today comes from the story of Jesus and the disciples on the lake during a storm. And Jesus' ability to command the storm and still the waters is a sign of his relationship to God as the Son. Yet today's gospel reading is not the story of Jesus stilling the storm, but him teaching on the lake shore from a boat. And him being on that boundary in between, between the sea and the land. And then he asked Simon Peter to have faith and put his nets out one more time, this time out into the deep. I picked this passage because I want us all to acknowledge the abundance that God provides for us from the deep waters. Our lakes, rivers, and oceans feed us, they cool us, and they give us life. Modern cosmology may be different from the old Hebrew, but this much has proven true. Life indeed emerged from our oceans. And all life, sea, land, and air, depend on water. And there is indeed enough, an abundance bursting our nets when we cooperate with nature instead of dominating it. Which brings me back to that view from 80 feet below. Now, our oceans are even more sensitive to global warming than the land. And the planet's coral reefs are already in deep distress. The people that I have gone diving with, they are like a fun and adventurous and enthusiastic bunch of people. Um, but there's also this deep sadness in the dive community. Because they actually see the changes beneath the surface. The old timers who've been diving for 50 years, they have stories about how vibrant the reefs used to be. And... All of us who are taking up diving today are worried about what are, that we're going to be just like them, telling the next generation of divers what it used to be like, how much better you things used to be. You know, right now, the best case scenario is that the nations of this planet collaborate on an unprecedented level in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Marine biologists predict that even in that best case scenario, we will have the destruction of about 75% of the world's coral reefs. But here's the real scary part. Just half a degree more, two degrees Celsius versus 1.5, means that we will lose about 99% of our coral reefs. The current trajectory we are on has us going past those two degrees, which means corals will be relics in aquariums, something to show our children in a museum, but will no longer exist in the wild. You know, in my second sermon in this series, I talked about the difference between seeing ourselves as rulers or stewards of this planet. And the ruler mentality requires that I give you a cost-benefit analysis right now, where I compare the loss of coral reefs to the economic benefits of increased energy consumption through fossil fuels. And now, I can absolutely make the case that preserving our oceans are in the best economic interest, and that the disruption of climate change is going to be far worse than any benefits of economic growth. But I shouldn't have to do that. Not here in church. This planet isn't ours to destroy. And the Great Barrier Reef shouldn't be subject to cost-benefit analysis. No, the oceans are sacred. And their holiness should be motivation enough to repent and change our ways. And this may mean sacrifices on our part, but it doesn't mean poverty or deprivation either. God has given us everything we need on this planet. When we cast our nets into the deep, they come up bursting to the brim. 
We can live on this planet. We can thrive on this planet. God knows how to keep things in balance. And God definitely knows how to provide. It's human greed, human arrogance, human ignorance that is driving this crisis, not the limits of nature. Nature is enough. If we care for the waters that surround us, they will continue to care for us. They will continue to bless us as they blessed our children in baptism today. They will continue to wash us, feed us, and mark us as God's beloved children. So we, we find our way to the waters of repentance, to the waters of transformation, to the waters of rebirth, so that we can be stewards of God's creation and not false rulers. Thanks be to God and amen.